uh, with a he's basically uh, the anatomist and he's going to talk on brachial flexures going into the very much into detail so dr george please thank you very much uh, mr chairman the audience um, it's now the third time talking about the brachial plexus so it's i uh, hope it's not getting bored again uh, anyway, I just want to give you some more information, a little bit about uh, anything what might happen over there. And also a little bit uh, something, an input concerning the technique, maybe a little bit changing, adapting to uh, get a better and efficient uh, block. Well, so that's why it's called additional brachial plexus anatomy. You already heard the anatomy yesterday. So, let's start. Uh, originally, I'm from Austria, yeah? so it's quite a challenge to work in Germany. Um, for Austria, Germany is not the big brother. You know, we are focusing on our German uh, neighbors a little bit with stress, especially concerning soccer or football because they are better. <laughs> they are world champion, we are not. We are just champions in analyzing everything. But anyway, I'm working over there. So see, Germany is, Germany is quite large. So I'm working in the middle part, Midwest, which is called Nordrhein-Westfalen, um, an area which you, you can go to now because uh, coal mines are closed. And it's getting green. So it's somewhere around in the middle of it. It's Witten. Witten is a very small city, about 100,000 inhabitants, which is compared to the other cities over there quite small. Uh, and it's a private university, unfortunately. But anyway, this is my way, a uh, working place. I live in Graz, so a little bit far away, about 1,000 kilometers, but not that bad. This is the main building. I uh, say, oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's the main building. Unfortunately, the anatomy is in a factory hall. So, wow, very charming. But you will see some images. We're brand new concerning the infrastructure, so that's bad, not bad. Let's go now to my topic, brachial plexus. You see the different areas, again, um, concerning uh, the most important, or let's say the most important two areas are the interscaline gap and the supraclavicular region. Because you perform so many blocks over there, especially concerning shoulder uh, surgery, and I just want to give you an input concerning also nerve, nerves you should take care of, uh, and also bring you up uh, a little bit the anatomy over there, the special anatomy, why it's causing problems and so on. Then, of course, you get the infraclavicular region we talked about yesterday and also the axillary fossa. I want to give you a little bit of topographic anatomy now, more precisely, and a little bit longer, and what happens over there, and why you should also take care of some other <laughs> nerves, which you regularly, if you perform the axillary block, uh, not reach at or with the existing techniques. So, you see now several uh, arrows. The green arrow is the way how you uh, get to the, in, to the interscaline block. Uh, the red arrow is uh, the area where you perform the supraclavicular blocks. Infraclavicularly, of course, you can go laterally, vertically, whatever. Uh, you, per, you see the, the cords already being formed. And then in the axillary fossa, the green arrow is really at the area where you see the latissimus dorsi in the back. So this would be the area where you perform the axillary block. And you can see this dissection with an abducted arm. Well, that's fine. It, it gives you an impression how the nerves are running, but they do not really uh, present the reality at all. Because there's much more. There's no, not only nerves about that. There's much more about the uh, tissue which is surrounding, covering. So this is something what you have to take into consideration when you perform blocks and which might give you some stress because your local anesthetic is not running that way you want to have. 
So let's focus now a little bit on the interscaline gap. The interscaline gap is over here visible uh, with an elevated shoulder, or let's say a little bit uh, moved up. So you see the also caudal part of it with the artery and the brachial plexus exiting dorsal to it. And this is a very important topography. The uh, plexus is always dorsal, and that's caused by the embryology. Um, anyway, there are different, let's say, morphological structures which can, which can separate artery from the brachial plexus. You know them. They are described since more than 150 years. Uh, it can be a muscular structure like the mus uh, scalenus minimus muscle or ligamentous fibers, which are the costal um, pleurovertebral ligament, as an example. So there are different structures which can really separate your structures from each other. And don't be nervous. Don't be afraid of it. Well, they are frequent. Yeah? So the interscaline gap, it's really a gap. It's not a space. It's filled up, unfortunately, too. And one important thing is the prevertebral fascia, which is covering the entire uh, structures. The prevertebral fascia is a very thick fascia, especially when you know that you're performing uh, the classic technique, the electrostimulation guidance, you have a second or resistance in the deep, which is the click of your prevertebral fascia. That was the old, uh, old way prior ultrasound guidance. And this fascia, as you can see over here, is really enveloping the deep muscular structures, but also the phrenic nerve. So it, he's part of the fascia. He's a little bit close to the fascia. But if you remove the fascia, you can slightly um, work with your scalpel, and he stays on the anteriscaline muscle when he's crossing to the medial area. This fascia is important because if you go underneath, and you have to go underneath to reach the brachial plexus, forms a space or limits a space which continues in different directions. And if you use high volumes, and they used to use high volumes, if you remember Vinny with his 40 ml, at the very beginning, you have to think about what is doing or what are doing 40 ml in such a space. Well, they are searching for a place. And they will spread. Sometimes not as you like to. OK, let's go now to the prevertebral fascia. You see the prevertebral fascia in the next slide, slightly elevated. And then if we elevate a little bit more, you see with the phrenic nerve on it. It's in the space. So if you have an injection to the brachial plexus, it might reach also your phrenic nerve in this area, more caudal, more medial, or more cranial, depending on the volume and on the spread of the volume. A cross section with a prevertebral fascia is dense connective tissue layer at level of C7. As you can see, this is the transverse process, the posterior tubercle. Anterior tubercle is just a slight bulge, nothing more. Uh, regularly, not that well visible, but sometimes clearly visible because being a neck rib. Uh, but you see, the brachial plexus in between with, mu with muscular bridges in between anterior and middle scalene muscle. If we enlarge it, you see the close relationship at that level to the phrenic nerve. And just yesterday, when we saw the image of Netta, one of the most wonderful drawings and used uh, atlases, you had the phrenic nerve just anterior to the anteriscaline muscle, far away from the brachial plexus. This is at level of C7. Watch out the distance. This is less than half a centimeter. So sometimes the drawings do not give the correct impression and the correct topography. 
And if you insert now a needle and put the volume in between the superior trunk and C7, where you regularly are with your needle, with the medial direction, guess what? I'm sorry. Sometimes this is the reality too. And you will see even more. What is also important, the continuation of the space. The continuation of the space means if you stay underneath the pre-vertebral fascia, you always have to have a risk to go medially into the uh, vertebral canal because it's the same space. The epidural space is a continuation into the pre-vertebral space underneath the pre-vertebral fascia. So if you inject a high volume, higher than five milliliters, you get a risk to get medially. That's for sure. You can go medially inside of the vertebral canal. You can go medially eventually into another triangle, which is not quite nice because that's a really frequent highway. Like that. This is the scalino vertebral triangle. If you want to go there, okay. What's in there? Oh, just something like the stellate ganglion, vertebral artery, phrenic nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, vagus, some other arteries, some more veins, some more sympathetic fibers. Oh, great. But that explains a little bit more, does it? So if you go, you get this spread, maybe, with high volumes, or eventually, same space, doesn't matter. So medially, to get medially with your volume is not dangerous, but it will cause some side effects. Something new? Oh no, not at all. You know the literature. It is mentioned, but sometimes not really regarded. Also this one. It's a quite interesting, uh, let's, let's say, interpretation because the actor fascial and, and so on. So the brachial plexus sheet, which is a little bit something like a myth. From my point of view, also after the dissections, it doesn't exist. So you do not see it in ultrasound as an example. You do not see also some fascial structures in most of the um, drawings. By the way, there is an important error in this image, not only because the clavicle looks like a fibula or whatever, um, the brachial plexus is ventral to the artery. Nice. Um, so sometimes you get incorrect information due, due to uh, whatever, lacking knowledge or what um, the drawer or the designer has no anatomical knowledge and also the reviewer. Uh, didn't look like properly, like over here. Wonderful image, isn't it? Wonderful drawing. I would, I would love it. The problem is this is not the first rib. This is more a second rib. The second is you got too many um, nerves reaching the brachial plexus. Uh, the phrenic nerve is running in a course doesn't exist at all, and the brachial plexus sheet does not exist either. So you get so many errors in one image, but you're following it. This is one took, taken out of one of the regional aesthetic textbooks. Something like that. Nice drawing, but lacking any fascias. Fascias which are so important, as you already saw. You, this is really not taking reality. By the way, injection of 20 milliliters following Winnie's technique, 20 ml, not 40, 20 reaching the aortic arch in very many cases. So you see, the prevertebral fascia is a very dense wall, limiting your space and also prohibiting sometimes a very good spread. So as a consequence for this area, anything what is larger than five milliliter, you really should consider uh, if you really want to inject. You get a well, unwelcome spread. You have to be aware of any, um, let's say, variations over there. And one of uh, the other structures over here in the supraclavicular region, as an example, is the so-called corner pocket, causing you some deep troubles because you do not get to the inferior trunk. Why? Is there any morphological structure? Answer, oh yes, unfortunately. As you can see it over here, enlargement, supraclavicular region with the omeroid muscle, 
the vertebral fascia underneath. And then we go deeper. You see the brachial plexus, just side to the subclavian artery, suprascapular nerve already arise. And if we go even deeper, some arteries passing by, like the deep uh, dorsal scapular artery, quite frequent. So if you, if you go uh, into the supraclavicular region and you find something which is pulsating and it's not the subclavian artery, ah, that's just the deep, uh, the dorsal scapular artery. Very frequently, about 30%, passing through your brachial plexus. And what about the corner pocket? Uh, this is now just prior uh, removing or elevating the prevertebral fascia. This is the prevertebral fascia elevated with the uh, super trunk, middle trunk, and over there you see the fascia. This fascia is really covering the entire inferior trunk. And that explains if you just stay at the superior trunk, you will not, or you might not reach uh, the inferior trunk due to this fascia. Do you see it in ultrasound? Oh, yes. And that's explaining why you have to go through this fascia to get the inferior trunk too. It's visible. You just have to take a look on that and know what you're looking for. Okay? At the very first moments, we also just took a look and said, yeah, that's the inferior trunk. We didn't see the, this white line. And say, we didn't recognize, oh, that's the fascia. Later on, after years, because of you. You said, hey, I got a problem with the inferior trunk. I have no why. So we had to take a look on that. So next thing, why going medially with your needle? Why having a, a medial directed needle? No idea. That's why we had a, a publication about the lateral directed needle following the parallel topography of the brachial plexus with a lateral directed spread. This was an injection of 20 ml, and the nerve, the phrenic nerve, is spared. Nowadays, we perform it with ultrasound and reduce the volume a little bit. We are now at a volume of 2.2 milliliters for shoulder surgery, 2 ml for the brachial plexus, and 0.2 for some others. Because now we have to think about, is it safe for shoulder blocks? No. Because there are some other nerves missing, and these are the supraclavicular nerves from the cervical plexus. So you have to think about them too. And these are the 0.2 ml, because we perform an additional block of the supraclavicular nerve trunk when he has pierced pre-vertebral fascia, and then dividing into the different nerve fibers. Visible in ultrasound? Yes. Absolutely. I can show it to you, if you like to. I already did yesterday, to some. Okay, so you see the superclavicular nerves, quite in close relation, but superficial to the pre-vertebral fascia. So easy to identify and easy to block at that time. What about the others, superclavicular regions and interscalene gap? To sum up a little bit, I'll give you four goes. Yeah? First, go lateral with your needle. Think about it. Then, go lower with your volume. If you're precise with a needle, volume can be reduced. The volume is already used in, uh, with, by my colleagues since years. And it's running pretty well. Yeah? Go into the pocket if you need to. So really, pierce the fascia, and especially think about the superclavicular nerve. So go superficial. Four goes. And then you really get into no troubles anymore. OK, axillary fossa, just a short overview. What do you not reach? There's intercostal brachial, medial cutaneous, and the axillary nerve. And the reason is quite easy. You get also two fascias over there. So you get the superficial and the deep axillary fascia with the deep axillary space and the subfascial axillary space. This would be the regular place for injection. So you know this. Redundant. And over here, you have now the area of the deep axillary space with all the fascias. 
and the cross section with the uh, nerve fibers surrounding the artery. And this is the most important thing. Got 11 seconds. You see the fascia elevated, but even inside you have fascial tunnels, which means they are separating the nerves from each other. And this you have to take into consideration when you perform the blocks. It is a very important thing because then you have to take the sniper technique. And if you want to have the intercostal brachial, you have to go into another space, which is the subfascial axillary space. Is it visible? Yes, indeed it is. Okay? So you see, you have to take the sniper method. One for each. Okay? That's it. Okay, from my point of view, I just want to conclude now, give you some impressions, short ones. This is now our workshops, our master class, where we dissect also with the proof, you see, with the cadavers, which are flexible, quite nice, almost lifelike indeed. Also, you can see some guys you already know, like uh, Paul Kessler. So, Ezra is also a uh, representative. And anyway, you see, we are not at the limits. We are not at the end. Still a long way to go, sometimes a little bit uh, yeah, hard, difficult, but anyway, we'll grow and we'll get better. Thank you.